Hello. Hi, good morning. My name is Lisa Felipe, and I'm the director of the EPIC program, and I'm excited, as I hope you are, for today's lineup of talks, discussions on teaching and learning in the humanities. Many of you were here yesterday for VCJ Paul's talk, and we thank you again for spending this time with us. To those of you who are joining us for the first time today, welcome. We hope that the day proves to be both informative and inspirational, and that we are encouraged to continue to drive ever more towards pushing the boundaries of what is possible in the humanities so that we may inspire our students. Uh, just one note, immediately following Dr. Pasquarella's address, we will have a break as we set up for the panel. Um, our first panel. While we don't have time for a Q&A, we encourage you to keep those questions and comments in mind, especially for today's final respondent panel, where we will be discussing in full all of today's talks. So now I have the great honor of introducing our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Lynn Pascarella, the president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Dr. Pascarella was appointed president of the AAC and U in 2016 after serving as the 18th president of Mount Holyoke College uh, from 2010 to 2016. Dr. Pascarella was a provost at the University of Hartford from 2010, 2008 to 2010 and was the vice provost for academic affairs and dean of graduate school at the University of Rhode Island, where she began a career as an ethics professor in 1985. A philosopher and one of us, one, of, uh, one, <laughs> one humanist, <laughs> uh, whose work combined teaching and scholarship and local and global engagement, Dr. Pascarella is a champion of liberal education access to excellence and access to excellence in higher education as well as civic engagement. She, was, she has written extensively on medical ethics, metaphysics, public policy, and the philosophy of law, and is the host of the Northeast Public Radio's The Academic Minute. Her keynote address, High Impact Practices in the Humanities, Transformative Teaching and Belonging in the Academy, will discuss some of the alarming trends that negatively impact higher education today, from budget cuts to the distrust of higher ed institutions. In response to these trends, she'll be highlighting some of the ways those of us in the academy can counter these perceptions through not only public engagement, but also by working to dismantle the structures that create inequity within and beyond our own classrooms. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lynn Pastorella to the stage. Thank you for um, being here, and let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. It really is such an honor and privilege to be here with you this morning. And uh, I want to begin by thanking Dr. Felipe and everyone involved in the planning of this event. Um, as I was walking across the campus this morning at, at 7.30 tweeting, I mentioned that it was just stunning that everybody was smiling and, and happy and ready to take on the day. Maybe this is unusual, but it was really welcome, <laughs> uh, especially to someone from BC. <laughs> so, um, during the past year, AAC and U has been engaged in a comprehensive integrative planning process centered on restoring public trust in the promise of liberal education and inclusive excellence. It launched at our 2018 annual meeting held at the end of January in Washington, DC. The resulting plan, we aspire, creates an ascending narrative that contests accusations of irrelevancy and illegitimacy leveled against higher education in general and liberal education in particular. At a time when there's been a decoupling of higher education from the American dream, the plan serves as a collective call to action to make visible the transformative power of colleges and universities. 
and for those of us who believe that higher education is inextricably linked to our nation's historic mission of educating for democracy, the work seems more urgent than ever. This urgency is enhanced by the reality that we are living in an ostensibly post-truth era, grounded in a new allegiance to poet Emily Dickinson's ironic enjoinder, tell the truth but tell it slant, success and circuit lies. However, we are here today to reaffirm the role that the humanities play in discerning the truth. The ways in which they serve as a catalyst for interrogating the sources of narratives, including history, evidence, and facts. The ways in which the humanities promote an understanding of the world as a collection of inter interdependent yet inequitable systems by expanding knowledge of human interactions, privilege, and stratification. And the ways in which access to the humanities fosters equity and justice, both locally and globally. In doing so, we recognize these charges against the humanities for what they are. Collusion in the growth of an intellectual oligarchy in which only the richest and most prestigious institutions reserve access to the liberal arts traditions. As some of you know, the public purpose of higher education is something I am particularly passionate about not only because of my role as president of an organization whose mission it is to advance the vitality and public standing of liberal education and equity as the foundations for excellence in undergraduate education and in service to democracy, but also because I was the direct beneficiary of a program designed to promote civic engagement and leadership through educational opportunity. The summer I graduated from high school, I managed to escape the factory work I had done alongside my mother the previous summer, only because I received funding under the Federal Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. At the time, CETA funds were reserved for high school students who were at risk of permanent unemployment due to extreme economic and social disadvantages. That fall, I continued working 35 hours a week under a CETA grant while attending a local community college with the additional help of Pell Grants and Perkins loans. As an only child, I had decided to forego a full scholarship to my state's flagship university in order to serve as a caregiver for my mother who had become chronically ill. Two years later, I transferred to Mount Holyoke College and within another two years was off to Brown University to get my PhD. But when I graduated, I vowed that I would never forget the lessons learned in that transition from community college to the Seven Sisters and the Ivy League. Throughout my career, I've been committed to promoting access to excellence in higher education, regardless of socioeconomic backgrounds, to the centrality of liberal learning, and to advancing political scientist Benjamin Barber's notion of colleges and universities as civic missions, where we not only educate every person to make her free, but we free every person to make her educable by serving as a visible force in the lives of the most disenfranchised members of society. However, in these days of widespread skepticism regarding the value added of a college education, I am concerned that we are eroding democratic access to the more substantive avenues by which learning enriches us all. We're impeding access not only to the public purpose of higher education, but to its personal purpose as well. By the personal purpose of higher education, I mean engendering the capacity to grapple with the most fundamental questions of human existence. Among the courses I signed up for during my first semester of college was an American literature class. There weren't many students in the class, most enrolled in courses that were easily translated into jobs, or any job at all. Um, one evening, my professor arranged for us to go see a Hartford performance of All the Way Home, the Pulitzer Prize winning play by Tad Mosel. I had never attended a professional production before, and Hartford was a world away, known only to me as the place my father traveled nightly on a third shift bus to work as a welder at Pratt & Whitney. I remember piling into the car with my classmates dressed in a blue velveteen jumpsuit. It was the 70s after all. <laughs> And when the light 
lights dimmed, I was transported. In the dark, perhaps especially in the dark, I felt a part of something important. Surrounded by classmates, I stared ahead of the stage and waited for what I could not yet see. After the play, our class went for Chinese food and talked. The performance had raised so many big questions about faith, grief, and trust. We discussed the last act when a wife mourns her husband's unexpected death. I hope he loved being, she said, recognizing the possibility that he never realized his own strength and potential. What that evening taught me, and why I remember it after all these years, is that we all have a right to experience being. We are all entitled to live in our strength. We all deserve opportunities to find our best and most authentic selves. A liberal education can be a guide to such personal enrichment. But when we imply that the only outcome students care about is money, we run the risk of circumscribing their futures, both personally and in the public domain. Indeed, positing employability and workforce training as the lone metrics for determining higher education's value precludes a consideration of the ways in which the illumination of human consciousness through literature, philosophy, music, and the arts enriches us all and enables us to flourish fully as human beings, individually and as members of a community. Thus, when the board of directors of AACMU expanded the organization's mission in 2012 to embrace inclusive excellence as inextricably linked to liberal education, the goal was to signal a commitment to the ideal that access to educational excellence for all students, not just the privileged, is essential not only for our nation's economy, but more importantly for our democracy. Nevertheless, increasing access to educational opportunities alone is not sufficient to destabilize the reproduction of social inequality in the academy. In the 2017 report of the Wisconsin Hope Lab, Sarah Goldrick Rabb and her colleagues, Jed Richardson and Anthony Hernandez, revealed growing rates of food insecurity among community college students, with two out of three experiencing this phenomenon. At the same time, half of the, this population is facing shelter insecurity, and 13 to 14 percent identify as homeless. These students are forced to be constant innovators in their own lives, addressing not only issues of social and cultural capital, but issues of cognitive bandwidth as well. In her book, Bandwidth Recovery, Sierra Sheldon recognizes that those who are worrying about where their next meal is coming from, about whether they're going to be beaten to death at night because they're sleeping in their car, aren't going to be able to focus on their academics and so they have a much less significant chance of learning, persisting, and graduating from college. So while the liberal education for all campaign is derided by skeptics as elitist, the real danger of elitism comes from a failure to recognize the disparate impact of such rhetoric on those who are already the most underserved members of our society. The most significant challenge facing higher education today is a growing economic and racial segregation. Community colleges and other state institutions enroll more than three quarters of all students. And yet public education is becoming increasingly privatized. <clears throat> Student aid has failed to keep pace with rising tuition. And the fact that the publics have had to do more with less has led to more contingent faculty, larger classes, and widening gaps between publics and privates in terms of spending per student. It's no coincidence that the shift away from the notion of higher education as a public good to a private commodity coincided with opening the gates of the academy to women, to first generation college students, and to students of color and the poor. College completion rates for those of the lowest socioeconomic rungs continue to lag far behind those of their wealthier peers. Redressing this phenomenon will require offering an education that preserves that prepares every student for success, not only in work, but for citizenship and life. Only by drawing attention 
to the entrenched economic and cultural barriers that continue to thwart the equity imperative upon which the American dream is built, will we be able to make progress in deepening and accelerating the pace of achievement for first-generation college students, poor students, students of color, and others whose stories are not being told and whose voices are not being heard? In the foreword to Ver Sheldon's work, I mention a book of poetry that I came upon when I was president of Mahalio College, written by Emma Willard, the legendary champion of girls in women's education. As it turns out, the volume was entitled The Fulfillment of a Promise. Though her poems were never the subject of great literary acclaim, there is a singular image in one of her works that comes to mind when I think about her leadership in higher education and the role that we must play in promoting social mobility and equity. In the poem, Willard describes her sister, Anna, who had just recovered from a period of lengthy illness. The couplet reads, and never had we known how sweet this scene when Anna's self and Anna's form is seen. I love that line, when Anna's self and Anna's form is seen. It speaks of transformation. In this case, recovery from an illness. But it also illuminates what Ver Sheldon is enjoining us to do, to educate students so that their selves can emerge and they can live the full potential of their lives, to see the world beyond their front doors, to find their passions, and to align the persons that they are with the persons they hope to be. Yet if we're to make strides toward an equity-minded approach to higher education that helps each and every student find herself in her form, we need to reject once and for all the deficit perspective that focuses on what students are missing and instead adopt an asset perspective, offering evidence-based interventions and high-impact practices through the targeting of cognitive, non-cognitive, and psychosocial factors. This requires acknowledging and addressing the burgeoning and att attainment and achievement gaps and disparities in college readiness, access to resource-rich institutions, and spending per student. It requires investigating the rates at which students of color are removed from the classroom for disciplinary problems, suspended from school, subject to over-surveillance and incarceration, and it requires examining the ways in which the language of and assumptions about diversity, equity, and inclusion perpetuate colleges and universities as sites of exclusion by privileging those with social and cultural capital. The latter point is one that is highlighted by Amy Olberding in her exquisite essay, The Outsider. Olberding recounts her experience in graduate school when she first realized she did not have the standard cultural and class equipage of the, of the academy. Now a college professor, she admits to still feeling ill-fitted at times in academic environments, yet she straightforwardly rejects the cultural construct of the imposter syndrome and the price exacted for overcoming it. She writes, quote, lately academia has grown more sensitive to how its culture flattens or normalizes those who populate its ranks. Imposter syndrome is a way of normalizing how non-standard identities can provoke alienation. Class is one such structure of exclusion alongside race, gender, sexual identity, and disability. But what are the epistemic costs of fitting? If we only look at alienation, we ignore the ways in which that subtly enforced sameness diminishes understanding. Academia has long been reserved for the upper class, for those with financial and especially cultural capital, and this limits what academics typically see, or more accurately, admit to seeing. Even though many of us do not belong to the normalized cultured class of the stereotype, our modes of interaction often encourage us to talk as if we do. The result is that the world we say looks cleaner, simpler, and more pristine than it really is. In the end, she confesses that some of her own dissatisfaction with belonging 
results from a restless critical impulse, a desire to see what that cleanliness is obscuring. Olberding's message reminds us that we need to engage in pedagogical practices that enable us to view students through a new lens, one that offers a more complete picture. We know from the Gallup Purdue study that such practices are more crucial than ever, especially for underserved students. The widely publicized study examined workplace engagement in individual well being in a large sampling of college educated men and women. The researchers wanted to assess whether alumni felt intellectually and emotionally connected with their work and gained fulfillment from what they were doing. On the well being side, they measured whether individuals felt financially and physically secure, whether they had people and resources to support them, and whether they had a sense of purpose in their lives and connection to their communities. What the Gallup Purdue research discovered is that there's a relationship between four specific college experiences and graduates' engagement in the workplace, along with their sense of personal well being. Those four experiences are students' participation in co curricular activities, internships or jobs, immersion in projects that take a semester or more to complete, and mentors someone who cares about students as people and who challenges and supports them. Graduates who have some or all of these experiences report high levels of engagement at work and happiness in their personal lives. As I reflect on these four experiences, I'm struck by the fact that many of them place students in situations where the result is not immediately known, where students might encounter an unpredictable variable for which there is no textbook preparation. My predecessor, Carol Gary Schiller, used to say all the time that we've spent far too long relying on standardized tests as the metrics of success, asking students to provide answers to questions for which we already know the answers. Instead, we need to provide them with the skills necessary to address the unscripted global problems of the future for which we desperately need answers. Ensuring that students don't see academic disciplines as separate and disconnected silos of learning, but rather as varied approaches to the same enlightened end. The past few decades have seen considerable effort among institutions of higher education to develop students' critical thinking, to take a problem, analyze it, examine context, and evaluate validity. However, all too often, the thinking stops there and students are not asked to examine a problem and create solutions of their own. The question we need to be asking our students is, so what next? Providing opportunities for our students to take a crack at solving the world's problems is one of the most profound ways to take them seriously. In doing so, we're not only preparing them for the future, but moving them now to take the next generational step. I had the opportunity to observe firsthand the benefits of this type of approach to teaching and learning when I was at the University of Rhode Island, uh, where I was leading an interinstitutional, multidisciplinary, vertical research team intended to facilitate clean water solutions, sustainable agriculture, and entrepreneurship for women in Kenya's Bus Lake District. The project lasted for well, it's still going on, but I was involved in the project for five years, and, and the communities that we collaborated with had a 33% HIV rate, a 69% poverty index, 80% of the families were polygamous, and they still practice widow inheritance. So when a woman's husband dies, she is inherited by a male relative or a jader or male prostitute to cleanse her of her dead husband's evil spirits through unprotected sex. So this, of course, it leads to a proliferation of HIV. In addition, within the community, the symptoms of AIDS were not considered to be a result of a virus, but a result of chira, a thinning disease, that was seen as a consequence of violating cultural norms. The Centers of Disease Control in Kenya joined a variety of governmental agencies and nonprofit organizations to provide medication and social services to those who were identified as HIV positive. 
Yeah, many of the residents were not dying from AIDS, but from AIDS-related illnesses, from dysentery and diarrhea as a result of a lack of access to clean water. Though USAID had constructed a well in one of the communities in which we were working, once one of the well parts broke, they had no way to replace the part, and so they had no access to clean water. So what we were doing uh, to try to avoid this kind of obstacle in the future was to come up with ultra-affordable, sustainable solutions that used local materials. We were using moringa seeds as natural flocculants, clay pot water filtration, sand filtration, um, and, and finding out what was best for the communities in which we were working. So we appeal to local epistemologies to identify the best ways to harvest sand from the local riverbeds without machinery, to create grass kilns, which turned out to be much more effective than the kilns that were being designed in our engineering labs in the United States. Um, but while these ultra-affordable engineering solutions were developed quickly, the implementation was a challenge. Residents often wanted to uh, have quick solutions. And so while we knew that colloidal silver uh, using clay pot water filtration was much more effective than using moringa seeds, it took a long time. And so there was resistance among the communities. In addition, we needed a way to communicate the effectiveness of these solutions to a community that spoke and read neither English nor Swahili. It spoke Luo. And so even though we had engineering solutions, we didn't have a mechanism for communicating how to use the solutions once we were gone. And so we worked with teams of artists in the art department, um, students who were given a semester long project to develop images that could be transferred onto conga cloths that would communicate the messages effectively. And there were lessons learned along the way because the images that they first portrayed on the conga cloths showed the type of woman that they would see as a typical African woman. And that is, if you download African women, you get an image of a, a Maasai woman, tall and thin. The Luo women looked at the Congo boss and they said, these women look sickly. We're not like that at all. We are robust. And, and, and so there was education there about cultural confidence for our art students who, in talking to the communities, then went back and reshaped their designs. So they were coming up with designs around not only clean water solution, but anti-malaria, safety in numbers, a number of different messages related to, to health and well-being. In addition, we had our natural resource economists working with our students in business schools, working with our medical students, um, and, and talking about issues of compliance, all coming up with plans that force them to engage in speaking and thinking across disciplines, in collaborative, integrative, evidence-based learning. The challenge with a sort of assignment, of course, is that you can't take students to Kenya every semester. Um, but what we did was to get feedback from the communities and bring it back into the classroom so that the assignments, as I mentioned, for the art students, for engineering students, for students in, in geology, was to take the information that we had received from the community members and try again. So how are you going to solve this problem now that these barriers have been identified? How are you going to work with the community? How can you communicate? Um, and in the end, it was an extremely beneficial learning experience for the students. And as I mentioned, it's still going on. So we know that these types of signature work, scaffolded, integrative assignments are enormously effective in promoting learning gains across the curriculum and into the workplace. Unfortunately, we're at a point in our history when the professional structures of academic scholarship, with its tendency to neglect teaching excellence, outreach, civic engagement, and public intellectualism, are alienated from a more widespread humanistic compartment to life, and therefore from the very purpose of the humanities. Until we change both the curricula and the reward systems within the academy, structural impediments will continue to marginalize the critical work of those dedicated to providing the broadest access to higher education through humanistic practice, practice that reaches beyond the gates of the academy. 
This is not just a matter of making our research on critical social issues understandable and available to the broader public or practicing the scholarship of engagement. Instead, colleges and universities must transition away from the expert model of knowledge generation to publicly active scholarship, which enacts democratic engagement designed to promote a more equitable society by partnering with K-12 business and industry. If we hope to bolster the reputation of higher education within democratic society, we need to have a visible impact on the communities in which we live grappling with real world problems alongside our neighbors, locally and around the globe. This model of publicly active scholarship breaks down barriers and establishes a bilateral relationship between research expertise and local epistemologies, between public and private, scholar and citizen, that can serve to erode the partisanship of competing ideologies that's plaguing our society. At the same time, we must infuse civic learning outcomes progressively across the major so that multiple kinds of civic knowledge, skills, values, and actions are understood as dimensions of the discipline itself. We must prove false, humorous Mark Twain's assertion that all schools, all colleges, have two great functions, to confer and to conceal valuable knowledge. As Canadian philosopher Mark Kingwell notes, while those of us in the academy may askew populism in its critique of life in the ivory tower, quote, we're losing when it comes to reason and critical intelligence and civility. We are losing when it comes to the basic justification of what we do. We're losing on defending universities as forces for good. Kimball argues that it's despicable to enjoy the fruits of academic success and not feel a profound sense of obligation to demonstrate why our efforts have wider value than just our personal satisfaction. Though Senator Marco Rubio has recently recanted his assertion that we need more welders and fewer philosophers, claiming that after reading the Stoics, he's come to realize that we need both welders and philosophers, those of us in higher education must countenance the extent to which we have perpetuated the persistent prevailing narrative that we should train more engineers than art historians, more people in business and industry than in anthropology, and that only those at prestigious institutions should be able to take out loans to study religion, gender studies, or the classics. Caught between nostalgia for the tweedy past of the Lionel Trilling era and the jargon-ridden homo hipsters who give the appearance of actual relevance while having destroyed any connection between their work and the public, because they're caught up in their own language game. Many in academia have failed to keep up with the zeitgeist because they have forgotten the first rule of rhetoric, namely, know your audience. Much of contemporary scholarship has lost touch with the issues at the center of humanities and humanistic inquiry and the ways in which they get filtered through ordinary human life. While it was once in the tradition of humanity scholarship to address humanistic questions in the public eye, this is increasingly no longer the case. What we're talking about is the shift in the way we conceive humanistic practice, both within and beyond the academy. Currently, those who are shaping public discourse and framing debates influencing public policy turn out to be radio and television talk show hosts, political pundits, and zealots of one sort or another. These debates are taking place on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and through other forms of social media. So how can those of us in higher education facilitate conversations around the important matters of the day and spark interest in mediating pluralism through dialogue and civic understanding? We need to ensure that we are effective communicators of and participants in the events of our time using whatever modes of engagement are available to us to connect the work being done in the academy with people's lives. For example, Anna DeVere Smith, founder and director of Harvard Institute on the Arts and Civic Dialogue, uses documentary theater to demonstrate this capacity while confronting some of the most pressing ethical, legal, and social issues of the day. In her linguistic ethnography and one woman show, Talk to Me, Listening Between the Lines, Smith places herself in other people's words in the way that one might place oneself in another's shoes. 
Her objective has been to reignite our collective imagination about what it's like to be the other person and to show the empathetic soul of American identities whose words wait and create change. A riff on John Cage's notion that we only hear what we listen for, Smith insists if there's any hope for us, it lies in relearning to tell the truth and hear it, in reclaiming ourselves as a listening space. Not all humanity scholars need to serve as public intellectuals, yet those who do must cultivate rich forms of practice and collaborate with those who have technical expertise beyond the academy, including both consulting and exploiting media to get at enduring questions. If we relinquish the opportunities that would extend our reach and leave these channels of communication to the media moguls, public discourse will continue to decline and humanists will lose the chance to engender a true sense of wonder purely for the sake of didacticism. In the past, these more fluid forms of humanistic engagement were recognized and celebrated as an extension of, or even a form of humanity scholarship. Many humanists made a deliberate decision to forego publishing in peer-reviewed scholarly journals and wrote instead for literary magazines. Perhaps understanding that the reification of narrow technical engagement within humanity scholarship threatens to kill the humanities. Of course, the humanities landscape needs and feeds upon specialization, and I would certainly not recommend abandoning technical and intricate research as a foundation for addressing questions and fueling endeavors. I should mention that my dissertation was on the epistemological and metaphysical underpinnings of Franz Brentano's theory of intrinsic value, so I'm all for <laughs> specialization. Um, but in measuring humanities scholarship, we should do so in humanistic terms, not by abandoning or eliminating the scholarship that we're engaging in, but broadening what we value as an expression of that mastery. And yet at present, we go so far as to discourage pretended faculty from doing too much service or outreach. Activities engaging actual questioning human beings, whether in the classroom or in the community, drop out of professional focus. Academic institutions should actively reconsider pathways to recruitment, tenure, and promotion, placing scholarship into reasonable balance with humanistic modes of activity in the classroom and beyond. In doing so, we position the humanities as the necessity it is, not as a mere luxury, avoiding the risk of creating what Jefferson referred to as an unnatural aristocracy. Thank you so much. question and I think um, one of the challenges for the social sciences has been scientism and uh, an inability to embrace phenomenological experience, humanistic modes of expression in doing the work of social science and, and in the sciences. Uh, among this commission for the National Academies report will be coming out on integrating the arts and humanities with STEM with two M, science, technology, engineering, math and medicine. And there was a good deal of discussion about social science. Where does that fit in? How do, we, how do we do this? So I think that the challenges are the same, that we tend to focus on um, technical depth within our disciplines without recognizing the importance of breadth and the way that that is more significant than ever for student success. So we know in AAC News publication, 
it takes more than a major, where we did surveys of over 400 employers and, and students, over 600 students, what employers value the most is the capacity to engage in ethical decision making, interpretive learning, creation and innovation in diverse teams. What was startling from the, this study is that 80% of students thought that they were prepared to do this work, but only 20% of employers thought that the students were prepared to do the work. So what we're trying to do is to, to close that gap. So I think for, uh, it's true, the arguments that I made could apply to the social sciences as well, and, and to science. And what we need to do is to work together to provide this integrative learning opportunity for students. such um, wonderful communities of practice here. We know about your work at ACMU and we talk about it all the time. And, and that's why I think this message is so important. How are we recognizing this? And how are we working with our disciplinary societies in particular to train PhD students who value this? Because as a president or as a provost, I knew it didn't matter if I recognized the work of a particular faculty member as valuable. If their colleagues were saying, no, we want you to publish in these journals. Uh, and so how can we work with the American Historical Association, the American Philosophical Association, um, other disciplinary societies to engage in those conversations and to reshape the, the cultures? Right, well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure.